celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. Resurrection. This is the day in history, some 2,000 years ago, when the Lord Jesus, after he told his disciples that he was going to die and be raised on the third day, they didn't believe it. Nobody else believed it, but it happened. He rose from the dead, and that's called resurrection. And today we celebrate that day in history, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world commonly knows it as Easter, and that's that's good, that's a great term. But um, I'm, I'm sorry kids, uh, Easter is really about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Easter Bunny, we can talk about that later, but that ain't what it's really about. I mean, uh, it's fun to do all that other stuff, but the Resurrection Day, Easter Sunday, is about the Lord Jesus Christ resurrected. And so we greet you from Calvary Grace Brethren Church of Dayton. And um, if you uh, want to contact us in any way, Below the title on YouTube, you can click the down arrow and you will see our contact information. So we praise God, even for our friends that join in, family from different states and other folks, we're glad to have you today on this Resurrection Day. Well, I want to get started because uh, I'm not a sermonette type preacher, so I don't want to keep you too long this morning, and I want to get started. So um, we want to start with a word of prayer, okay? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, that in your sovereign mercy and wisdom, you saw this day in history before it ever was. It was a plan that you had set in place because you knew what our needs would be as sinful people. We need a Savior, Lord, and the only way we could have a Savior named Jesus is if he was perfect and holy and righteous and he had no sin. 
And Lord, he had to pay for the sins that we have. And he died on the cross for our sins and he was buried in a tomb and he rose on this day we call resurrection, we call Easter. And so we thank you, Lord, that we get to celebrate this day yet another day. Lord, we praise you for all that you do for us, how you've kept us safe during this coronavirus pandemic, which causes us to separate for a while. And Lord, we know that that's in your hand. The timing is in your hand. But we say hallelujah. Nothing can stop us. Nothing can separate us from your love. And Lord, so we celebrate today the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that everyone all over the world today who know you as Savior will give you praise and glory and honor and celebrate this day and spend this day looking at your word and spending some time with you in prayer, Lord, and worshiping you on this special day. Lord, it is this day in history is the reason we gather on Sunday because Jesus rose early on Sunday morning. We thank you today. Be with each one today, Lord. Open our hearts and mind to your word and let us hear what you have to say to us today. For we pray it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. We're gonna look at the word today. We know that the scripture speaks about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in each of the four gospels. And it makes mention in some other places, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all give an account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You'll find it in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John chapter 20. Now each one of these writers, these apostles and uh, leaders of God that God chose to write down his scripture, uh, they gave the same story from their point of view. And it's pretty much similar between all the stories. Each one may leave a certain thing out or add something different than the other writer did not add. So if you want the complete story of the resurrection, you have to read all four of the versions from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the version that I wanna talk about today is coming from the book of John, John chapter 20. And so if you don't mind, I would like to read that version uh, of the scriptures. So you can turn in your Bible and uh, hopefully I can share my screen with you and we can read about it together uh, on the screen. So let me uh, see if I can share this uh, screen with you, if it, will, if it will work with us today. And let's see if I can work it correctly. There we go. All right, you see me up in your right-hand corner, top right corner. Let's read John's rendition of the resurrection story. Starting at verse 1, chapter 20, as you can see there on the screen. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Let's stop for a moment, make sure we see what's going on. All right, Mary Magdalene was a lady that Jesus had delivered demons out of earlier, and she became a follower of Christ. And so she went to the tomb early, and the other accounts tell you that other ladies also went to the tomb, and they went not because Jesus, they thought Jesus had risen, they went because they were carrying spices and ointments to anoint the body with, which was a custom back in that time. So they were going to anoint the body and they was uh, really wondering who was gonna move the stone out of the way. And uh, so she saw that the stone had been taken away. So she ran and told the lead disciple, the lead apostle, which was Peter, and to the other disciple listed here in verse two, which we know to be John, the writer of this particular uh, gospel. And Jesus referred to him as the, the disciple whom I love. 
And so that was a reference to John. And so we see Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away. And she ran and told Peter and John. Let's pick it up in verse three. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple, which was John, outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know or understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. Let's pause right here for a moment. Let's, let, let's pause right here for a moment. Um, they went down to the temple and it says, John believed after he saw the tomb was empty. But you see, all of them, all of the disciples, including Peter, they should have believed because they were told on several occasions by Jesus himself that he was going to be crucified, be buried, and rise again on the third day. Now, he told them this in uh, Matthew 16, 21. He told them in Mark 8, 31 and Mark 9, 31. He told him in Luke 9, 22, and he told him later on here in earlier in this particular book of John in chapter two, verses 19 through 22. He told him that his temple, his body, the temple, he referred to his body as the temple because our bodies today are the temple of the Lord. Jesus said, this temple will be torn down and yet three days I will raise it up. And of course, they were thinking in the physical instead of in the spiritual. And the disciples asked Jesus, and they said, now, it took us 46 years. It took, uh, it took men 46 years to build the temple. They were talking about the physical building of the temple, the actual structure temple. They said it took 46 years to build this. And you say you can raise it up in thir three days? But Jesus went on to explain to them, but they didn't catch it, that he was talking about his body being delivered to death and then raising it back up on the third day. And so many people today don't believe it. And there's many people that doubt the resurrection. There's all kinds of theories out there that the body was stolen, that he just was uh, really in a daze and unconscious for a while and then he came back to life when he was laid in the tomb and the cool breeze blew over him. There's all kind of ideas out there uh, for people that are doubting the resurrection. But they all are disproven. None of them hold any validity. Jesus has risen. You can go to the tomb today in Israel and look in there and there's still nobody in there. Praise God. There's no other quote unquote religious leader that people follow today or religious leader that have been here in the past that it can ever be proven that they died and raised back up again on the third day or any day. Any religious leader that you ever know of or ever heard of that die, their bones are still in the ground. Jesus is the only one because he is the son of God. He took his life or let him take his life and he put it this way, I lay my life down that I may receive it again into myself. Praise God, he is the only one. He is the only one that can be the true savior of the world. I'm not disrespecting anybody else's religion. I'm just calling 
a spade a spade. He is the only one that rose from the dead and is alive right now. The Bible said he ascended many days after he arose and he came and showed himself to his disciples and had a discussion with them and gave them a commission that we'll see here a little bit later. And he went back to heaven and he's on the right hand of the father right now. And he's doing things for us. He's working behind the scenes. He's commissioning angels. He's talking to the father that's on his right hand. So he's on the right of the father and he's talking to the father for us. He's an advocate for us. Jesus Christ. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. We have an alive Savior. That's what it's meant by resurrection. He raised from the dead. Ah, wait a minute. I hear somebody saying hallelujah. Get, get, get off that ceiling. Quit jumping around so much. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let, let's get back to the scripture. Let's get back to the scripture. Amen. Amen. Let's get back to it here. All right. So now. Let's pick it up again at verse three. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran and we read that and he came. And in verse six, Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in the place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. Let's pick it up and let's see what happened next. Verse 11, but Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. This is Mary Magdalene, the one whom Jesus had cast out seven demons. And she became a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was here on earth. So she stood outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And you heard the song, oh, Mary, don't you weep. Oh, Mary, don't you weep. Well, she was weeping because she loved the Lord Jesus Christ and she wanted to honor him. She wanted to come and she wanted to worship by anointing his body with spices and oils along with some other women that's talked about in the other gospels who wrote about this. She said to them, because they, why, I am weeping because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, same question as the angels, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. Now, when he said Mary, the way that he had said Mary to her in times past, her eyes were open. And right away then, she knew it was Jesus. This wasn't a gardener. This wasn't an angel here. This was Jesus himself. So she said in verse 16, uh, uh, she turned him and said, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet, not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Well, hold on for a minute. Let's, let's, let's back up for a moment here. Let's back up. Let's back up. Oh, let's not rush. Let's not rush past this, this section of scripture right here. Oh, let's not rush past it. The title of my sermon today is Don't Rush Past the Resurrection. Don't rush past the resurrection. I'm going to say to you today, don't rush past this day. Don't rush past the resurrection. 
Don't make it just a routine Sunday. Don't think it's just another Sunday, another day, another message. Oh, no. Don't rush. Let me tell you what happened. Peter and John, they got to the tomb. After Mary went and told them that his body is not here. And they didn't believe. And they ran off and went back to what they was normally doing. But Mary, she stayed a little bit longer. She wept. And she was saying, oh, where did they do my Lord? I, I got to stay a little bit longer. And she stayed a little bit longer. And Jesus finally showed her something. She not only got to see the two angels that were there that spoke to her. She got to see Jesus himself. Himself. Now, what if the disciples had to stay there a little bit while? What if they sat down and just prayed and talked to God and said, Lord, show us, tell us what's going on. Um, remind us what you said to us in the past so that we can understand it. We, 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 don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't get it here. You're not here. What's going on? They had forgotten in all those places where Jesus himself told them that he was going to raise from the dead. But Mary didn't rush off. She stayed there. And she saw something that nobody else got to see. Oh, let me tell you, this is, this is deep. This is deep. Let me, let me go there. Let me go there. She saw the live version and rendition of the Old Testament Ark of the Covenant. Preacher, what are you talking about? You done going off the deep end here. I ain't gone. Ain't nobody got time. Listen. In the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 25, God was talking to Moses and the children of Israel after they had left Egypt out of slavery, crossed the Red Sea, and gone over into the wilderness and heading toward the promised land, and God was feeding them every day with manna and quail. He rained manna, which was like a coriander seed. It was like a little wafer biscuit type thing that God rained from the sky because they didn't have any food or a way to grow food in the desert. So God rained food from the sky called manna. He rained food from the sky so they can eat every day. Well, after they got a ways uh, through the desert on their way to the promised land, God instructed them to build him a sanctuary, to build him a temple. And so he asked all the people to, to donate and give their gold, their silver, and all the stuff that they had taken from Egypt that the people gave them when they were leaving because they were so mad about the plague that they just poured all the gold on them and said, here, take the gold, take the silver, everything, get away from here, leave us alone. We tired of these flies, we tired of these frogs, we tired of the river turning to blood, we tired of all these plagues, but now you done killed our firstborn with the death of the, the death angel coming through. And so they plundered them. The, 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 the children of God plundered or took much of the gold that the people of Egypt had and silver and the people poured it on. In fact, the Bible says they gave them so much that children of God had to say, stop. We can't handle no more gold. We can't handle no more silver. We got more than we can carry. Stop. That's how much they was getting. And then Moses said, give it up. God said, God told me to instruct you to give it so that I can build the tabernacle and the things that go in the tabernacle, which was the worship place that they were going to build. It was a great big tent with different compartments and rooms in it that they was going to build to, so the priests could do their job to worship the Lord, to make sacrifices, to make atonement for the people's sin. And so it was the pre-version of the stone brick and mortar temple that was coming later on after they got into the promised land they had to have a portable 
tent temple. They called it a tabernacle that they could take down as they were moving across the desert on the way to the promised land and then set back up when it was time to stop for a while. But during this time, God told them what to make, told Moses what to make in the temple and gave him all the uh, things that they were supposed to take. Now, let me read you a little bit. Turn to Exodus 25, please. Exodus chapter 25. And we're going to just look at a few verses. And um, let's look at uh, starting at verse 8. Let's see what God told them to do. Now, here it is. I'm ready to read. I'm not going to turn to the scripture on the screen. I'm just going to have you to turn to it, or you can listen to it here. Exodus 25, verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. This is, this is God talking to Moses. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. An ark is going to be this square box type structure that God was going to use to put the Ten Commandments in and some other items. And it was going to be in the most holy place in this tabernacle, which was the last room that was to be made in the tabernacle. And it was going to be divided from the rest of the tabernacle by a curtain. And it was going to be placed behind this curtain in this room. And it was going to be the place that God was going to put his presence. At any to all times, his presence was going to be there. And don't get me wrong. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere at the same time, past, present, and future. But this place, God said, my presence is always going to be there. It's never going to leave there. And so it's going to be a special holy of holy place. And nobody can come back here at any time except the priest. And then he can only come back once per year after he has made atonement and sacrifice for his own sin so that he won't be destroyed. God said, if anyone comes back here that's not authorized, or if the priest even comes back here and he has not made atonement for his sins and he's not coming back at the right time on the right day, he too shall die. God was very firm about this and the priest understood. Okay. And so verse 10, he, Exodus 25, and they shall make this ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits shall be its length, and um, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with gold, and out, and out you shall overlay it, and shall make it on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings for it, put them in the four corners. Two rings shall be on one side, two rings on the other side and you shall make poles, et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm going to move down to verse 18 because we're talking about the resurrection and we're talking about them angels, okay? And you shall make two cherubim, those were angels. Cherubim were angels, a special type of angels. You shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end. Remember the story in John? You saw two angels, one sitting at the head of where Jesus was, one sitting at the foot of where Jesus was in the tomb. Wait a minute. We paint a picture here. Don't rush past the resurrection. The disciples ran off after they got there real quick. They didn't believe. Mary hung around. And this is what she was about to see. She was about to see the visual fulfillment of what we're talking about in this Old Testament right here. Hold on. Don't rush off. Verse 20, Exodus 25, and the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. 
Um, and other scriptures prove that this testimony was the tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments that God wrote on them himself on Mount Sinai to give to Moses. And he put a couple other things in there as well. Verse 22, and there I will meet with you and I will speak with you, talking to Moses, from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Oh, did you catch that? Did you catch that? Let's go back and look at the scripture again. Make sure you didn't go by the resurrection too fast. Now, we read verse 11. We're on John 20 now, as you can see on your screen. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping as she stopped and looked down in the tomb. And what? Here's that Old Testament picture fulfilled right here, verse 12. And she saw two angels in white sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She saw a live picture of fulfillment of the Old Testament Ark of the Covenant. Oh, I'm telling you, the Bible is just filled with truth. The Old Testament, the entire Old Testament is a foreshadowing of what's coming in the New Testament, which was Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, God got something for us to do. He's got something for us to do. So let's continue to read this. Um, verse 19, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, first day of the week is Sunday, you know, not Monday. Look at your calendar. It's Sunday. When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. That this is after he had resurrected from the grave. He came at the evening and found the disciples where they normally would be hanging out, which was usually the upper room. And he came and stood in the middle of them and said, peace be with you. Verse 20. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Why did he show them his hands and his side? Because if you read, uh, they didn't believe. If you look at the other gospels, they didn't believe. They hid upstairs in the upper room because they feared the Jews was going to get them like they got Jesus and killed him. They didn't believe Jesus was going to raise. So Jesus came and proved it to him. He showed his hands and his side. Then the disciples, when they saw, were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them in verse 21, peace to you as the Father sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Well, they didn't believe, but they finally saw Jesus. What about you? Do you believe? What do you have to see? If you want to see Jesus today, he's not going to come down in the flesh just to show you the nail prints in his hand and the, and the, and the nail prints in his feet. He has given you his word, his word, the Bible. If you want to see Jesus, you got to see him through the scriptures. And then you have to decide if you're going to put your faith and trust in him yourself. If you're going to believe, the Bible says in several places, including Romans chapter 10, if you believe in your heart and confess your sins with your mouth to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you believe that he was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from your sin and separation from God. That's what you're getting saved from. That thing in you that makes you do wrong, say wrong, think wrong. Called sin. We all are born with it. 
it was inherited from our parents and they got it from their parents and our parents parents got it from their parents all the way back to the first two parents adam and eve they started this thing rolling by disobeying god and listening to the devil and we're still doing the same thing today. We disobey God by listening to the things of the devil. And the devil's behind the systems and the ways of the world, all the things that are contrary to what God says. And when we do the things of the world that are contrary to what God says, then God says it's sin and disobedience. And we still do it today. So even though Adam and Eve started the ball rolling, we keep it rolling. We keep the sin ball rolling. And so Jesus Christ says, if you accept me by faith and you believe in your heart and you confess that you're a sinner and ask me, I'll come into your heart and save you and deliver you from your sin and from the power of sin. He will deliver you from the power of sin. But you first got to believe. Oh, don't rush past the resurrection too fast. Take your time. Slow down. Look in the tomb. You see, Jesus ain't there, but he'll meet you on the outside like he met with Mary. He met with me one day when I was about 13 years old. I heard just like the disciples that Jesus was buried and he died and he rose on the third day. I heard it for years as a young boy, all the way up until I was about 13 years old. Then I decided, Lord, is this real? Is this true? I heard about you in my Bible class in high school and heard about you in my Bible class in junior high, which today we don't have Bible classes in junior high and high school in public school. You got to go to private school to get it now. But anyway, I heard about it. I heard about it at church. And one day I said, Lord, is this real? I, my life, I'm, I'm, I'm a teenager now and my life is, uh, what am I going to do with my life? Where, where am I headed? What am I to do? How am I to know, to know what to do with my life? And so I decided to listen to my Bible school teachers. I decided to listen to my pastor at the church. And one day I came home. Again, I was about 13, I was 13 years old. And I bowed my knee beside my bed in me and my brother's room with nobody else around. I don't even think nobody else was even in the house. There may have been somebody downstairs, but uh, my bedroom was upstairs. And I came home from school one day. I didn't even take off my good school clothes. You know, back then you, you had good clothes and you had play clothes. And when you came home from school, you had to take off them good clothes. If you got caught playing in them good clothes, uh, you might get a belt or a switch uh, from your parents. Okay. Those were the days I grew up in. So we had, you know, categories of clothes. So before I took off my school clothes, I bowed on my knee on the bed. I opened up my Bible and I, I specifically remember uh, looking at Psalms 51 where David was crying out to the Lord. Purge me with hyssop, Lord. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. Cleanse me. Create in me a new heart. I believe in you. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you was buried in the tomb. And I believe you rose on the third day called Resurrection Day, called Easter. You rose on that day and you did it for me. You died for my sins, but you rose for me to live. All you got to do is pray that prayer. And God will hear. He's waiting. He's waiting with wide open arms and saying, come, come in. He says, open up to me and I will come in and I will sup with you. I will come in and eat with you. In, in the custom of the ancient Jewish times, if someone cared about you and they came over, they, they came in and they sat down and eat with you. And then you knew if they came down, if you invited them in and they came in to eat with you, they were going to be your friend and you accepted them. Jesus says, open up and I'll come in and I'll sup with you. I'll eat with you. I'll have supper with you. I'll, I'll come into your heart. Jesus would do that. Amen. Let me move on so I can get to the conclusion here. In each one of the gospels where Jesus of uh, resurrection is spoken about in all four of the gospels, in some way or some fashion, God says, now that I have resurrected, he said to his disciples, and he said to us today, I got something I want you to do. I got something I want you to do. 
In Matthew, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And now I'm going to give you authority. And here's what I want you to do. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. He says, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. Make followers of me. Go tell people about me. Tell people about death, burial, and resurrection. Tell people about the things that I say, the things that I want you to do, the things that I've commanded you. Because I want everybody, I want all people to be saved from their sins, and I want them to have eternal, everlasting life. I don't want them to ever be separated from me and go to a place of torment and destruction for people that are separated from God. And that place is called hell and the lake of fire. He said, I want you to go make disciples of all the world. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, otherwise known as the Holy Ghost. And I want you to teach them all the things that I've commanded you. He says, if you do this, I will be with you till the end of the age, end of the world. He said, but this is what I want you to do till I come back. I want you not only to receive me yourself, but I want you to help others to come to know me. And then Mark, he told him after he had shown himself to his disciples, he said, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature means every human. Every creature, go preach the gospel. That's why we have people going all over the world to preach the gospel. We support people, we call them missionaries and other names we have for them. And uh, our church, we support missionaries that are both far away overseas and we support missionaries that are both in other states and local and right up the street from us. And so we have, we, we believe in supporting missionaries and we believe in reaching out to other people with the gospel in our own neighborhoods, in our own community. Now, I must confess, we don't do a great job of it. We've gotten very weak. We used to be better at it. But we got to keep reminding ourselves, this is what Jesus wants us to do till he comes back. He don't want us to just stay in the four walls of the church and just hope somebody come in there. No, he says, come in here and corporately worship together. But when you leave outside the walls, you are the church, not the building. So the church is just left out. Go gather people for me. Go spread the gospel. Go make followers of me. Make disciples. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. A follower of Jesus' way. Somebody who has made him their lifestyle. His principles his statutes, his, his uh, commandments. He has made them their lifestyle. I made this decision when I was 13 years old, and now I'm 61 years old. And I tell you, it's the greatest decision that I ever made, and it's the greatest decision that you will ever make in your life. It's greater than who you're going to marry. It's greater than what house you're going to live in. It's greater than how many kids you're going to have. It's greater than your spouse. It's greater than the best job in the world. The number one most important decision that any human being can make is to put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because God is the only one that can save our souls. Amen. Amen. I'll say it for you. Anybody else saying, I hear somebody saying amen. I, I hear Sister Sandra saying amen. I, I hear. Taylor, I, 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 Muffin, Muffin, did you, Muffin, did you say amen? Brother Phil, I know you on it, man. Amen, 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 amen. God bless you, God bless you. God has given us something to do. He's given us something to do. But don't rush past the resurrection because it is the resurrection that makes this possible. If Jesus had stayed dead, he'd be like all them other religious leaders that so-called people put their trust in. I ain't gonna name them all. I can't name them. It's too many of them. It's too many of them. But if the the one that you put in your faith and trust in, his name, if his name is not Jesus Christ, then he's he's still dead or he's gonna die. That's just fact. Ain't nobody getting out of this alive. If he's human, he's gonna die. 
Now, I know some people even worship the devil. He going to die too. The Bible says he's going to be cast into the lake of fire. Oh, you thought he was already there? No, no, no. The devil's not in hell. He's not in the lake of fire. The Bible says he's walking on this earth to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. God has allowed him a time and a boundary that he's limited to until God gets ready to dispose of him in the lake of fire. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 20. If your savior and, and your religious leader and your God, his name is not Jesus Christ, he died. He dying. Only Jesus rose from the grave. He, that makes him the only one qualified to save us from our sin. For he came for such a time as that to die for our sin, to redeem us to redeem us. Uh, young people, redeem means, you ever seen your mama take a coupon or have you ever seen a coupon that she got online or uh, she got on her phone or even got out of a newspaper or something or an, or, a, or an advertisement that came to the house and she take that coupon, it might say a uh, dollar off and you take that to the store and when you get that particular item that's on that coupon, instead of it costing uh, $10 and she give them that coupon for a dollar off, she redeems that coupon and she now get that item for $9 instead of $10. She redeemed the coupon. Jesus Christ redeemed us by dying in our place. See, me and you are supposed to be the one die on the cross, not Jesus. You say, but we all going to die one day. Yeah, we all going to die the that first death, which is not the big one. The first death is the physical death. We're not talking about that one. The physical death, we, our body, and, our soul and spirit leaves this body. And then the body goes back to dust eventually after it deteriorates. But your soul and spirit leaves the body because it cannot die. So it goes to be back with the one who created it which was God, or is separated from God and sent to a place God has designed for its torment. It's called hell and ultimately the lake of fire. There's no in-between. I'm sorry, there's no waiting. There's no in-between. When your soul and spirit leaves your body, it's called physical death. It goes to be with God or it goes to the place of torment. There's no in between. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. The Bible tells me so. It says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's for believers, okay? To be absent from the body for non-believers means to be immediately lift their eyes up in hell, the place of torment. I believe that's in Luke chapter 16, about the middle of the chapter. God gives a story to that effect, a real life story about a man named Lazarus and a rich man. They both died and Lazarus was a follower of God. And the Bible says immediately he lift up his eyes in paradise, which was the Old Testament version of heaven. And a rich man who didn't believe in God died. And the Bible says immediately he lift up his eyes in Hades, which is a, a old word for hell. I believe it's in Luke 16. The Bible tells me so. Jesus Christ is the word. Now, let me close by making emphasis on uh, the title of the message today. The title of the message was Don't Rush Past the Resurrection. Jesus Christ, according to John 1, the Bible says that um, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And in verse 14 of John chapter one, it says that word became flesh. In other words, Jesus Christ is the word of God 
that came down out of heaven and put on flesh and became a person. He's the word of God. He is the one that the word inside of that Old Testament Ark of the Covenant that was in that temple, that represented Jesus coming later on. He is the word. That's why I get so excited every time I read John chapter 20 and it talks about the two angels, one at the feet, one at the head of Jesus Christ. And Mary Magdalene is the only one that got to see that because the other the apostles rushed in there and saw that Jesus went in there and rushed out. They didn't stay long enough to see Jesus. Mary stayed long enough. Don't rush past the resurrection. Stay long enough to see Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Trust him today as your savior. You can't go wrong. He'll get you through this coronavirus pandemic. He'll get you through any other things that come along. When you got Jesus Christ, you got the blood of Christ, and the blood of Christ protects you from all harm. The arrow that flies by night or the pestilence that go through in the daytime, it don't matter. God has got your protection. And he tells us in Hebrews, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you know Jesus? Accept him today. That concludes the, the message for the day. Again, I say, Hallelujah. God bless you to you. And I look forward to seeing you soon, that we're getting back together soon. But I don't know when. I ain't going to say I do because I don't. We have to wait on the Lord and see what he says. In the meantime, be obedient. Amen and amen.